So, so here's the thing, right? Imagine, you know, the thing about evidence-based medicine is it's constructed in such a way that it, at first it seems hard to argue with. Well, of course, like a big study that you spend a lot of effort on or meta-analysis or like a systematic review where you pulled every single paper out, uh, you know, that does seem like the best evidence and we should use that for clinical judgment. That, that would seem like, you know, the right, right thing. What is not being included though explicitly is the cost and the time and then the excess morbidity and mortality that occurs during that time. So the cost of both money and, and, and frankly, in this case, deaths, right? But let's just say morbidity and mortality in general, associated with compiling that evidence, right? Because um, if it's, it's, you know, to make an analogy from, from engineering, you can always make code perfect, you know? But, but there's, a, there's a diminishing return in terms of making it incredibly perfect versus having it be functional. And, and so that's an alternative paradigm, which, you know, one could call results-based medicine, right? And results-based medicine is iterative medicine. And the difference with evidence-based medicine, here's one way of putting it. Imagine, you know, like uh, if, if the only way that you and I um, could communicate, we could never send a WhatsApp, you know, or, or, a, or a tweet to each other. We could only communicate in book form, okay? Or, or, in, or in peer reviewed study form. So what that would do, if you think about that, you'd say, well, that's dumb. Not everything I have to say to you is like a small message, right? You know, or, or, or rather, not everything I've said to you is, is a big thing. Many times it's like a small message. And if you make me write a book or do a paper before I can communicate some concept to you, well, that increases the cost of entry, that increases the barrier to entry. And so lots of things that don't necessarily make it to the level of a publishable result do not get communicated. They don't exist because they're not in a paper and you can't cite them, okay? And um, so, you know, that's lots of things, you know, for example, like how to hold, uh, you know, the, the nasal probe, just as an example. I, I'm sure there's actually a paper on that, but these are like aspects of technique that um, it may seem trivial to publish and you might find it hard to get into a journal. It's a lot of effort to write it up versus just like kind of showing someone how to do it, right? So, so what I think happens in, in, you know, I'm not against all, you know, RCTs or systematic reviews or anything, not at all. Those, those things have their place and they're, they're fine. But I think of them often as more of the end point of something rather than the beginning of something. Uh, because what you start with is iterative medicine and you basically talk to other doctors, you look at the patient, are they jumping out of bed or are they dying? Okay, well, try something else. And especially in an emergency situation, it's clear that that's you know, an ethical approach because the patient is often, and they may die otherwise. Uh, it's a very serious condition. So, um, so we, we kind of have no choice. But even I think outside of pandemic situations, iterative medicine is how, um, you know, like, like a drug like penicillin was discovered and then discovered to be effective through an iterative process. So it wasn't an RCT. The effect size was so large that, that it was clear that penicillin worked. It was, it was the magic drug, the wonder drug. And I think that um, what we really underrate today is the strength of iteration in increasing effect size. Because I want to linger on that point. Basically, you know, there's a lot of things you can do with a drug, right? You can change, uh, you know, like dosage. You can change the timing of dosage. You can change like formulation. Is it like inhalable or is it, you know, swallowed? I mean, you, you have some constraints, but, you know, you can change that. Um, you can, you can certainly go back to lab. You can try other drugs. Uh, you can try, you know, like, um, like so-called compounding pharmacies can, can make, you know, combinations of drugs. Um, and you can even play with things like, uh, like pill pack, which is packaging, which is actually more heavily regulated than people think um, to improve compliance. There's actually a bunch of different parameters that you can play with. But we're basically, you know, prohibited from iterating on those kinds of things because you have to sort of like lock a parameter set for an RCT, and it's arguable as to whether that's the best way to do the hill climbing process. Because if you go back and you look at insulin or penicillin, there was iteration on the manufacturing process and so on. It was like, go to a patient, kind of go back. But when's the last time you filled out a feedback form to a drug company, right? They don't really iterate on customer feedback. It's like a fixed kind of thing, you know? Um, and uh, whereas with tech companies, of course, you know, they iterate all the time. And it may seem not obvious that you could iterate on a drug 
or treatment, but you, you can. And to give some sense of that, just take a look at all the, you know, the, the doctor groups that are, that are on Facebook now and how people are sharing techniques for ventilators and when to put somebody on, you know, this or that drug or all the branching. There's tons you can iterate on in terms of treatment. But if you're prevented from doing that because you have to write a study before you can, before you can try it, that actually adds a cost. And the cost of that cost is now visible in, in terms of morbidity and mortality. Yeah, I think the way you phrased that is really nice. Results-based iterative medicine. Um, it's well, results-based medicine is kind of a, it's a play on words. It's kind of like, because the evidence-based medicine guy says, oh, you know, everybody's not doing evidence-based medicine where they're just like, you know, playing with sticks and stones. It's, 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 it might as well be, you know, the Flodgestone theory of, of medicine or whatever. Results-based medicine is kind of like the, I hate to say it this way, but it's kind of true. It's kind of like the West Coast version, okay? Because results-based medicine says, oh yeah, well, you're writing papers over there, we're getting results. And you, you sort of just match the same level, okay, where you're like, what actually matters is patient outcomes. And, uh, you know, patients aren't guinea pigs and they shouldn't have to get a placebo if they're dying. Like that may be unethical, give them the best available treatment uh, as opposed to, you know, making them guinea pigs, right? Um, and I mean, these are not these are not new debates. You know, these are these are these have been debates have been rattling around forever. What is new is that every single person in the country has a rooting interest in it, and so these kinds of decisions that were usually made in back rooms are now front page news. They're the only thing people care about on Twitter. Yeah, so I think this transitions nicely into kind of the concept of like decentralized science. Uh, we had a journal club a couple of days ago with someone who's essentially uh, self testing a gene therapy for HIV. And so it's more or less like an N equals one study where if they have the results, they'll be able to take it back and do more with it. Uh, you've spoken a lot about uh, N equals one studies and right to try. And I'm curious how you think that would apply in the current situation. Well, um, okay, so let me, let me talk about the ideal situation and then the current situation, okay? Um, the ideal situation is it's not just N equals one, but it's T equals, let's say 37, that is to say, you have 37 years of diagnostic wearable data. Um, and, and this, by the way, is something which we would have a ton more of. Uh, many people now have years of Fitbit data or months to years of Oura Ring and, and so on and so forth. Um, but there were a lot more sensors that, for example, Apple was gonna put into the Apple Watch and a lot of other companies were gonna do that the FDA basically blocked. You know, Wall Street Journal wrote about that in 2014. You can find it, I had a tweet on it. Um, but essentially we would have millions more people, maybe hundreds of millions of more people with diagnostic grade wearables on their wrist, which would have given us time series data and early warnings on, on lots of this stuff. We would have seen a lot of people getting fever. Um, you know, there's some of this already, by the way, it's like, uh, I think Health Meter, um, if, if, I didn't, if I got it wrong. Um, there's, a, there's an aggregate service that is actually like, a, I'll find it after this, but that is um, aggregating a bunch of temperature data to look at fevers and, and so on and so forth. You could go much, much farther with that. And the, the point I'm making is rather than, you know, N equals one is kind of like a dismissive sort of way of doing it, which assumes that the only access you have is, you know, you have to do more people. But there's another access, which is you could go time-based and you could look at your baseline over time across a ton of different variables and you could get data out of that. To show, by the way, that that's a valuable thing to do, um, you know, there's a famous paper by Mike Snyder's group, you know, Profit Stanford on, on the integrome you know, Q.bio is, is um, building services around this. But the Integrome basically was, um, if I, was it the Integrome? I think that's what they called it. Uh, basically, Mike Snyder just said, hey, give me every test in the book. We're going to run everything on me for like 30 days in a row. I forget the exact time period. And he was able to detect himself becoming sick before he got sick because he could see those transcription factors or whatever they were. You could see gene expression changes changing before he felt sick, right? Moreover, the viral infection he got seemed to aggravate like diabetic symptoms. So you could see interaction effects that you weren't seeing before. So that's like a sophisticated kind of study. That's not just a N equals one, hey, how do I feel kind of thing. Um, it's actually math, you know? Uh, and so that's the ideal case, right? The ideal case is we have so much diagnostic grade wearables data. You have all of these analytics on yourself. I mean, we know, I've said this you know, for many years, but we know what's going on in Bangalore or Budapest, but not in our own body, okay? And so instrumenting that, I think, is going to be one of the most important things we can get out of this as a reform in the 2020s. 